On today's show, we've got Howard Beck talking Kobe Altman, lessons from the Cavs playoff loss, and roster building challenges with the Cavs. It's Howard Beck, so you're definitely going to want to tune in to today's episode of Locked on Cavs. You are Locked on Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. Thrilled to be joined by Howard Beck. You can read him at GQ right now. You've read him a ton of other places over the years. Howard, thank you so much for coming on. I wanted to start by asking about Kobe Altman. What do you make of Kobe Altman? He has a interesting CV. Every time I look back at his 2018 to this run, it is full of things I forgot that happened with Chauncey Billups <laughs> and Larry Drew and then LeBron's like, like there's a whole bunch of stuff. So what do you make of, of Kobe Altman? Yeah, uh, good to join you, Chris. I, you know, I, I think on balance, he's done a pretty good job considering the circumstances of his uh, elevation to the position um, coming, you know, around the same time that, you know, you knew that LeBron was in play and he was going to leave again or, or probably was going to, which he did. And um, inheriting a team that was, you know, kind of nearing the end of a cycle. And now it's OK you're the new GM. You're, you know, I can't remember how old Kobe was at the time, but I think he was maybe the, the youngest GM in the league at, at the moment that he uh, succeeds Griff. And then here's the the hardest challenge in the world, other than actually building a championship team is like, oh, we had a, a championship caliber team that is now kind of like aged out, breaking down. Uh, we've traded out every every future piece for the most part to uh, fortify the present um, with an exception that we'll get to. Um, and and good luck. Here you go. Oh, by the way, the greatest player in franchise history, one of the greatest players of all time is leaving in July. Um, not easy. I think, um, so a couple caveats on anytime I discuss, like, you know, oh, this GM, how have they done? How are we assessing yeah. their, their track record to date? Um, one is that pretty much every GM has a, a checkered record of some sort, right? Even the greatest of all time. Jerry West had plenty of mistakes. Pat Riley and his group in Miami have made some some mistakes along the way here, um, and yet they're in the finals again. But still, they, you can you can go back and we can nitpick all of these things. Bob Myers, Bob Myers, who is being rightly celebrated right now as he steps away from the Warriors. Um, hey, four championships, you can't argue with anything, but you can still sit there and go, well, yeah, but what were they doing when they you know picked Weissman or how come some of these draft picks didn't sure. work out? And um, so everybody's got this. So I don't I don't want this to sound like I'm picking on Kobe at all. Um, also, by the way, second caveat where it regards the Cavaliers um, for most of Dan Gilbert's tenure. Um, and maybe it's been a little different since the health issues, but he's been a pretty hands on slash meddlesome owner. Um, it's not been easy yeah. for any of the GMs who have worked for him. So keep that in mind. Also, um, I thought that Kobe's early moves, I, I didn't. I, 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 was, I didn't agree with. Doesn't mean he was wrong. Just means I personally would. I don't know if it matters what I think, but I didn't I, like I didn't think it was the, the, the right move to hang on to the Nets golden ticket that turned out to be the eighth pick, which turned into Colin Sexton. I always thought if you've got LeBron James, you have to be all in at all times. I've said the same thing during his time with the Lakers. I've said the same thing about the Warriors and the way that they've handled some of the last few years with Steph Curry. Draft picks are meaningless if you've got one of the greatest players of all time. Um, you know, get veteran help, period. Extend the run as long as you can when you've got one of these guys. So I've been fairly consistent with, with, with that, that view. So I, 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 I wasn't convinced that that was the right move taking or uh, holding on to that, that pick that became the eighth pick in 2018. Um, I didn't think it was, I didn't understand the move to max out Kevin Love on an extension in the wake of LeBron leaving. It was kind of almost like this act of transactional defiance, right? Where it's, We'll show you, you know, we're, we're still going to be a great, viable franchise. We've got an, a perennial all-star, Kevin Love. We're going to max him out and keep him and keep rebuilding. Um, I thought they were, you know, the better move there would have been to just like tear it down and spin off Kevin Love and other, other, other players at that stage. Um, didn't think it was the right move to fire Ty Lue that season. Um, didn't think it was the right move to cut Kevin Love this season. So there's been, <laughs> you know, there's been some of these, but like, look, on the plus side, one, look at where they are right now. You know, Kobe has presided over the rebuilding in a, in a you know, fairly reasonable amount of time 
into the best num- best non LeBron era Cavaliers team since the 90s. That's not nothing. Uh, getting in on that Houston Brooklyn James Harden trade and peeling Jared Allen off of it was a, a phenomenal move, just really sharp. And then, of course, you know, they've now got Jared Allen on a great contract. Um, getting Lowry Marketing, who eventually turns into Donovan Mitchell, they got him for Larry Nance Jr. Like, fantastic move. Um, obviously, drafting Garland and Evan Mobley, um, acquiring Donovan Mitchell. Now, I, th- I think, we, you know, at, at this stage, I don't know how Cavs fans are feeling about it. I think there's, it's been probably in some ways a mixed bag with Donovan Mitchell so far, but it's only one year. It's too soon to judge the, the, that trade, I think. Um, but on balance, I think, I think Kobe's done a really nice job. And again, comes into this having a ton of, you know, a, a wealth of scouting experience, a, a, a fair amount of front office experience, but it is his first GM job. And, and I think, you know, everybody takes a while to kind of get settled and figure out the best, the best path for you and, and your team. I think the the Kobe part of it that I think sticks out to me is is maybe is a cipher through Kevin Love because they went they cared a lot about the optics of the Kevin Love resigning. Yeah. I don't know if you're I don't know if you remember them putting him in a suit was they were like doing arena reconstruction and it was mm-hmm. like Kevin Love uh, there's a photo I will send it to you. But there's a photo of Kevin Love like in a suit as he's signing this massive contract in front of like a bunch of construction workers on their break and I'm like okay you you the optics of this are insane, but it's like you're trying to say Kevin Love is here. He's a man of the working people, but it's like this. He's getting more money than they will make in their entire lives. I don't totally understand like the optics of this. Um, they hired John Beeline, who they went, who, which I don't think was really a Kobe hire, but they sold it as a Kobe hire in the way that he's like he met him at a wedding and Mike Gaines introduced him. And it's like, OK, my red, my my BS detector is is high on you saying you met John Beeline at a wedding and thought he was a genius. But he, you know, he turned Sexton into Donovan Mitchell as part of that trade. He. The Jared Allen trade is a good one. It is a complicated job to move on from LeBron. Yep. And I think it also sets up his biggest challenges now, which I think involved Donovan Mitchell. I think involved the new CBA. I, I mean, when you look at where his job is at now, what are those those big challenges? Oh, I mean, in some ways, the leap from mediocre to solid playoff team that can you know maybe win around is the easier of the of the leaps the harder leap is going from 51 win team to true contender um there's a certain amount of this where we could say you know what um evan mobley is going to continue to evolve and he's going to become an all nba caliber player and that alone will help propel them from you know 51 to maybe into the to mid to higher 50s uh win team um that darius garland has much more growth to come that the Garland Mitchell pairing, which I still remain a little bit skeptical about, by the way, but like that, 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 that uh, you know, the, the optimist view would be give them time and they will figure out the best way to leverage each other. And, and that will pay off more down the road and then give yourself time to, you know, figure out ways to manage the cap where you can, you can, for, you know, fortify this, this bench that clearly was a disaster in the playoffs. Um, so, you know, but this is what happens, right? If, if you, when you make an all-in move, whether it's an all-in move because you signed a max player and it tapped out all your cap room, or whether it's an all-in move because you traded, you know, all of your best assets for one star, you're always putting yourself a little bit of a deficit and then it takes some time to rebuild around it. Look at the Phoenix Suns. They got Kevin freaking Durant, but it, they, they gave up a ton to get him. There wasn't enough time to backfill because that trade was made mid-season. But hey, now the Suns have the offseason to reformat their roster around Durant and Booker, or maybe around Durant, Booker, and Aiton if he's still there, and Chris Paul if he's still there. And similarly with the Cavaliers, like, okay, you made the all move for Donovan Mitchell a year ago. It limited what you could do after that, but every offseason gives you a, a chance to kind of reset a little bit. So, um, look, they're, they're one of the rare teams where you, where, where you looked at it and you were like, Man, love love their four top guys. Everything from their fifth starter on down feels like a mess. Um, and that was certainly exposed in the playoffs against the Knicks. Um, I, I, I couldn't help watching that series and thinking, and yeah. I understand there's no way they could have gotten him, but man, the Cavs are the team that should have gotten Josh Hart. Like, he would have yeah. been phenomenal for them. Yeah. Uh, but that required a first-round pick, and the Knicks had extra, and the Cavs had, uh, you know, a deficit because they, they traded them all. Um, so they couldn't have gotten him. I'm not blaming them for not getting him, 
Um, I don't know if there was a more creative way to find somehow find a way to get yourself a first round pick that you could have then rerouted. But um, but yeah, they needed a Josh Hart and and then like three more bench guys. <laughs> yeah, even just like one Josh Hart would have just done them a lot of good. Before we, we move on to more playoff stuff, the Garland Mitchell thing you said about some skepticism, is that defensive for is that the defensive fit? Is that the way they kind of play together offense? Like, what is it about those two? That you still have some inherent skepticism about all of, all of it. it at the moment they made the deal. And, you know, look, I'm based here in, in New York where, you know, surrounded by Knicks fans who were disappointed that they didn't get Donovan Mitchell. But <laughs> um, but I but I I liked the fit better with the, the Cavaliers than the Knicks anyway, because I thought Donovan, they already had signed Jalen Brunson uh, by that point. So I thought Brunson and Mitchell together was not going to be a great fit, uh, especially defensively. And they don't have they didn't have the defense behind them that Mitchell and Garland do. And so I thought if it could work with an undersized offensive minded backcourt maybe it works in cleveland where hey you've got jared allen and evan mobley behind you and that turned out to be the case in the regular season at least that 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 worked um it it was kind of you know those those factors kind of offset um but and 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 look i thought mitchell did a great job this season of of really uh you know extending himself defensively in a way that i don't think he did on a consistent basis in utah um i just when they lost that that series against the Knicks, like you know, and, and you know, Garland had a couple of games where he was just invisible. Mitchell just never quite got going in the way that we're used to seeing him. He's he, you know he was a big game performer in Utah. It wasn't just like oh I'm going to put up numbers. Like no, he was like that. That guy could could really uh, embrace the moment in 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 big moments. Um, and I I couldn't help but wonder as I watched them kind of unravel. Is this just part of the consequence of not having that much time because of injuries, because it was a choppy season, that they didn't, that that backcourt didn't have enough time together to really learn how to, to leverage each other, play off each other? Maybe some of that points to, to uh, scheme and coaching. That's fair. Um, but there just didn't seem to be, for, for what should be one of the most potent pairings in the league, they just didn't get uh, enough. They didn't get almost anything out of them at times in, in, that, in that series. Um, but it was, you know, it was Darius Garland's first ever playoffs. It was Evan Mobley's first playoffs. It was, you know, it's a, it's a, a kind of a young team. Um, and, you know, I, I, would, I would give them a little bit of grace for not having uh, been quite at their peak then. But yeah, um, they're, they're still going to be undersized and they're still going to be two guys who operate best with the ball in their hands. And so it takes some effort to figure out how to best uh, channel that into wins at a high level and playoff series wins. Apologies for these sirens. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. A bet I continually feel great about that I that I made right now is a Nuggets title future that I put down right when sports betting came online here in Ohio. I got Denver at plus 800 to win it all. Feeling wonderful about that now that they're A, playing Miami in the finals, B, have a great rest advantage and just how the playoffs are shaking out. That team looks awesome. Feeling great about that. FanDuel, by the way, has always, always has awesome promotions to check out. It is safe and easy to use. You get paid instantly as well. And if you want to set limits every month, you can do that too. That's how I decide to enjoy FanDuel responsibly. There's no better way to place a bet on the playoff action than at America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That is FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. So that leads me, Howard, to look at the playoff lessons. I've been looking at the the playoffs and wondering, okay, what is what has happened the rest of the way? What is actually applicable to what Cleveland can learn? Some of it, I look at Miami and I'm like, you can't really get Eric Spolstra, <laughs> like you can't get Jimmy Butler. I you can't have Pat Riley, like in whatever that culture is. It's hard to replicate that. Other teams would have done it by now, I think, if they could have, right? But I I look at the wing play. I look at the op- these bigger guards teams even have. Like look at Boston had Brogdon and Smart and Derek White. They had bigger guards that could scale up defensively. That is my thing. It's like I think you have to try to find guys that even if they aren't as good as those guys, you need g- bigger, tougher guys to just kind of round out what you are. Is where where do you go when you think okay you lose to the Knicks the way you did? Clearly there's a, a ways to go to get to where they say they want to get to. What Mitchell has talked about wanting to get to we might need to do to keep Mitchell happy. 
what do you think is are the are the lessons you have to take away if you're Cleveland? Well, I mean, look, overall, the lesson of if we just want to look at the finals right now, you're looking at two teams that have had continuity and patience, right? Like Jokic, Jamal Murray, and Michael Porter Jr. have been together now for, you know, like five years. And Michael Malone is one of the four longest tenured coaches in the league. Granted, that's a low bar these days um, because of how often the coaches are turning over. But like it's it's Pop Kerr. Spolstra and Michael Malone are the former longest uh, tenured coaches in the NBA. So I think part of what this finals in particular speaks to is the need for teams to, you know, establish what they're about and, and then just like let things marinate for a little bit. Don't panic. There are multiple times that the Nuggets could have panicked and gone a different direction, especially when Murray and Porter were hurt. There were times when the Heat could have certainly moved a different direction. Um, so in general about this postseason, I know you're asking about the Cavaliers specifically, but I think in general, yes. we are seeing once again, if we're talking about the lessons of this postseason, based on the teams that got to the finals or even the conference finals, I think continuity matters a lot. And this Cavs team, in a lot of respects, just got together. So they need some time. Um, so that's 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 one. The other, though, is, look... I, I look at Mitchell and, and Garland, and I think about John Wall and Bradley Beal. I think about Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum. I think about Lillard and now Anthony Simons. Um, recent championship teams have generally been built around, like, mutant wings. You know, Kevin Durant and Giannis and Kawhi, obviously LeBron. Um, no, one, no one's really getting there based on a, a one-two punch of guys who are 6'2", 6'3". And you you mentioned it, you know, about the ability to scale up and about having bigger guards and everything else. Like part of that is that this is a salary cap system. This is a salary cap league and one that's getting tighter by the day. And I know we'll, we'll talk about the CBA a little bit, too, probably. But like the new CBA is going to make it even harder if all of your money and it's not all of it. But if a lot of your money is tied up in two smaller guards and they're not that small, I mean, we're not talking about like Chris Paul size and they're not, you know, or Isaiah Thomas of, of, of the Celtics size. But still, it's a smaller backcourt. Um, you have to compensate then for that in some way. And it's going to get tougher when Evan Mobley uh, gets his extension off of his rookie deal, assuming that Jared Allen is still there. Now you're going to have you know, four guys making quite a bit of money. And where, how are you getting the, the, the big guard or the big wing, um, the bench, everybody else? They're, they're, you could argue that they're almost over-indexed on scorer slash playmaker Six two guards, six three guards. So, I, I I think structurally that that creates a challenge. I'm not saying it it can't be done, but I I just think that there's no template for that. Um, as as you noted, you know the the heater about Jimmy Butler, a, a a big guard who can you know who can who can play a few different positions, uh, and who's who's also just like tough as hell and you know defends his butt off. Um, that's the other thing too, right? And we know the Cavaliers will defend at their best. Um, but you know, defense matters. Um, and, and I just, I, I think having, having a certain kind of, of matchup that the other team has to reckon with, uh, and that's going to, to cause them to, to get out of their comfort zones and have their defense break down, uh, all matters. And in today's NBA, again, that's largely about, you know, bigger wings, not necessarily about smaller guards. Yeah, I, I've watched like Max Struess play, f much less Caleb Martin, who, you know, may be the best player in the conference finals, which is a wild thing to say. But <laughs> like I've watched Max Struess and it's like that guy would start at the three for the Cavs and it would be like an improvement over Okoro and Levert and Jenny sure. Osmond. Like, it's just like, oh, it's like. So would Caleb Martin, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb Martin would be, would be wonderful. But they and they've missed on that stuff. Like Okoro was a top five pick. Levert, I, you know, I think in retrospect that if we talked about first round picks. That was a first round pick out to get him in and that in retrospect i think that that was yeah. probably an overpay um especially because you brought ricky rubio back anyway before we we hit on the the little more roster stuff i want to ask bicker staff i think in another era of has basketball read um a different era of dan gilbert uh i think you could have seen him getting fired i think that would wouldn't have surprised me if, the, if this was a different era but they've preached culture a lot they've preached consistency a lot of teams do that it doesn't always mean anything but they went out of their way to say, we're sticking with him. This is our guy. Did, what do you just make of him as the head coach of this group and, and how he how he coached this team, frankly? 
Yeah. So look, um, he's, he is still a, a younger coach experience wise. I know he's been around a while. Um, and they've made some pretty, you know, uh, dramatic changes in his time there. I think I'll go back to the patience card. I think, you know, mm-hmm. you know, coaches evolve too. So, um, I think, I think, you know, he, he needs some time, deserves some time. And, and yeah, it's good that they're, that they're in a little bit more patient mode now than, than maybe that franchise, um, once was they didn't lose to the Knicks because of coaching. I don't think, I mean, I, I, I know there were some quibbles along the way in that series, but they're, we, I think everybody agrees. Like they had four good players. <laughs> the drop off was steep. That and, makes it really uh, tough. How many of those four players even played well is the other. Play. It's like Jared play. Allen. Yeah, yeah. Didn't play well. No one played well. No, no. And, and there's even their strengths became weaknesses. Like they couldn't do, they weren't out rebounding the Knicks. They weren't, you know, they weren't out defending them. They weren't like, you know, what happened to the, the things that, that kind of defined them in the regular season. Um, and, and, you know, that's I, people, I, I love it when people would be like, Oh, the coach didn't have them ready to play or the coach didn't inspire. Like you can't, no one's going to inspire you. You're professional NBA players. Like you, 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 your motivation is your own. Um, a, a, a coach can set the tone. Sure. Um, and establish expectations and everything else. But, um, if, if, if Jared Allen is, doesn't look like Jared Allen all of a sudden, if Darius Garland looks like he's just completely like deer in headlights, uh, which he was at times in that series, I think, I'm not blaming him again. Like first ever playoff series and the garden was, <laughs> was insane. Like I was there for a couple of those games. Um, not an easy place to be um, as an opponent. I, I just, you know, and by the way, also a four losing to a five isn't really an upset. Like I, I will say that across yeah, the board, it's not, like it's, you're, yeah. you're interchangeable. Um, so so yeah, I, I I don't I don't have any particular deep critique of 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 JB Bickerstaff. I don't either. I, I think I think you have to hope that he learns from that. Um and that also he probably maybe has a roster that he trusts more. Because you I think what you could feel more than anything in that series is that he didn't trust the options that he had to plug in and do stuff. Where it's like you look at Spolstra and it's like playing he's playing high smith and it's like that guy hasn't played much for us we can throw him in at a playoff series and we think he's going to be okay there, there's yeah. a trust factor deep down the bench that i i don't think bigger staff had yeah How and we'll that, finish yeah go ahead yeah sorry i was, I was just gonna say that it, it's, it's a it's a curious thing right like is it because the heat just did a really good job of getting a uh, 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 you know guys like high smith ready um or is that a, is it about the player himself like you know Bickerstaff did reach at times for some of these guys and they stepped into roles and just couldn't handle it. So is that the player? Is that the coach? Like, this is the problem with when we try to evaluate coaches, given that like 95% of what they do, we don't see, right? It's practices and shoot arounds and meetings and film sessions and all timeouts and, and all this stuff that we are not privy to. Um, so it's hard to say, but I just, I don't think he, I don't think he had great options. It's, it's, it's similar to the way I saw what, what Monty Williams was going through in the Suns playoff run where it's, he just seemed like he was hunting and pecking to try to find combinations. And it's because, well, you devastated the roster with that trade and your bench isn't great. And you picked up some guys off the waiver wire in the buyout market who didn't really, you didn't have much time to figure out how they work with your team or what combinations were best. And now, yes. And now you're in the playoffs and you're hunting and pecking. It's not really, you know, it wasn't, I didn't think it was Monty Williams's fault there and in a different situation with, with Bickerstaff. But when you don't have great bench players, you find yourself, kind of searching on the fly. Curious to see what Kevin Love uh, would have to say about some of that, just to someone in those situations. Just, no doubt. Just to be curious if he would, uh, if a Frank, you got a Frank Kevin Love moment. So when you look at this roster, Howard, we've hit on kind of what it needs, bigger wings, bigger guards, just different kinds of stuff. I would ask it this way. The free agency is going to be really hard for them to get the players they need. It's not a great market. The mid-level exception is nice, but like, you know, are you going to, is that really, is that kind of player going to move the needle? I, I, I guess when I think about this, do they need to get a little bit lucky and maybe have some things break in a certain way? Kind of like it did with Jared Allen where Houston didn't want him, I guess, in the James Harden deal. So the Cavs can swoop in and that gets them someone like, how, how do they reasonably maybe find the kind of players they need to kind of round out this roster in a meaningful way. 
It's definitely going to be tough. Uh, you know, I've already seen, I'm, I'm sure you have two suggestions of, hey, should they be trading Jared Allen on this really mm-hmm. team-friendly contract and seeing what you can get for him to fill out a lot of other stuff? And then whether you, you know, grab a, a minimum, you know, salaried center to put next to Mobley or whether you shift Mobley to center, however you want to do that. Um, I'm not sure... Not sure if I would be that bold. Um, you know, a, par- a part of what their their you know their their uh, character has been or their uh, identity has been is having that big front court where you know they you know that 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 allows them to be the defensive team that they've been. Um, and there's some versatility there too. You know, Jared Allen goes to the bench, and you can shift M- Mobley to center, but not full time. Um, Beyond that, yeah, you're talking, you know, the mid-level exception these days, if you're a non-taxpayer team, is up to like $12 million. So, okay, it's, it's a decent amount of money. You can actually get guys these days in a, in a, in a way that maybe you couldn't in a previous era. Um, they'll, you know, you, you can be opportunistic. Maybe there's a trade that they can get in on. But I just, even that, even like the, oh, there's a two-team trade, let's become the third team. It's kind of to what end? Because I, 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 like their bench guys aren't all that valuable. So, you know, do they have expirings that somebody might want? You know, like maybe there's a way to get in there creatively. Um, or maybe you just got to take roll the dice on somebody like your, your, your listeners may cringe. I don't know what Dylan Brooks market <laughs> value will be this summer. I don't know. I don't know no. what it's going to take to sign Dylan Brooks. I don't know how risky a gambit that might be especially with a younger team. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's presumably leaving the, the younger team that he's already with that, yes. their, that their leadership felt he was probably not the right influence for. Um, is there enough uh, structure in place and enough veteran influence in place to absorb a Dylan Brooks and, and have him not wreck you? Because his toughness and, and, and just positionally, he's, he's exactly the right fit in a lot of ways. I think if Dylan Brooks would make sense, I I would get being nervous about it. I would be um, look. But we've seen guys who have had issues come together, and it can sometimes work, and it can sometimes not. I mean, Cleveland has had this before in 2018. Kobe Altman to maybe bring this full circle when they when they do the Kyrie trade. One of the pieces coming back was Jay Crowder, and famously, uh, J.R. Smith had backfisted Jay Crowder in the face of years before, and I don't think those two guys ever exactly. Um, were, were lined up and there was there was buy-in with Jake Crowder and the whole LeBron thing. I think there was some weirdness there. That can happen. But like if Donovan Mitchell is like, okay, like I can do this, considering Donovan Mitchell was the one who uh, went out of his way to ether Dylan Brooks' status as an NBA player uh, after their little dust-up, you could do it. And also, it would be, for me, as someone covering the team, and I, that would be theater. I mean, that would be that would be fascinating because it would be an injection of a personality type that like they, they spent all of last year talking about how no one on that team really liked to speak up and was vocal and stuff. And you can bet Dylan Brooks is not going to be quiet if he's feeling certain things. Like that's just not what we know about him. That would be fascinating. The other names, it's like, okay, does Boston, this things get weird in Boston? Do they, and, and they didn't always play him in the playoffs. Would Grant Williams be available in a sign and trade if Boston does it? And that's a lot of money, but that would be like the, the dream or Dante DiVincenzo to me would make sense as a, as a bigger sure. guard on the wing, because I don't think, I don't know what Ricky Rubio is at this point, frankly, which is which is a tricky conversation because he has a multi-year deal. But you're gonna have to get like Dylan. I'm gonna be thinking about the Dylan Brooks thing for a while, Howard, because I just think it would be it would be <laughs> fat. The, his first home game when he checks in, I think they would need to put like WWE theme music and like really just make it a thing. You got to just lean into the bit at that point if you do that. Uh, that I would not put that past the game ops people in <laughs> Cleveland. Um, oh, <laughs> it, I would not either. Since, it is. Since, it is. That's kind of their mo anyway. It is um, very loud every single game with lots of fire coming out of the jumbotron. Yes. Are they still putting uh, like Ben Roethlisberger up on the scoreboard? Oh, Mich- yeah, Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. Yeah, yeah everything. Oh, yeah. It's silly. All that yeah, stuff is yeah. silly. Um, I agree. Uh, Dylan, look, uh, Dylan Brooks. Like I say, just I, I was part of it. Where I got there was I'm I'm thinking of like who's a free agent this summer specifically at small forward, right? Mm-hmm. Or just specifically wings first. Um, and look, he does bring a, a, a bravado and a toughness that I think that team could use. I think he would have made it like, imagine him in that series against the Knicks. I think that's, that's a, it's a, it's a different series. They might still lose, mm-hmm. um, but it's a different series. Um, you know, Josh Hart is the calmer version of that. <laughs> um, and you know, they're different players too, but 
Um, but Josh Hart is a free agent. But again, like I, I fully expect that with his bird rights, the Knicks are resigning Josh Hart. Right. So um, but but again, he's the right the right kind of fit in terms of just both positionally and, and skill set. Um, so, yeah, finding that guy is going to be uh, a challenge. But um, but yeah, I, I think they can get there. You know, um, there's I think there's gonna be a lot of movement this summer. I really do. Like, you know, teams re, teams are going to be reacting to the new CBA and trying to offload guys. And so maybe there's some deals to be made there. Um, there's I think there's going to be we're often wrong about this. We look at a certain draft year and we go, oh, man, you know, there's gonna be a lot of trades on draft night this year. And then, it you know, it ends up being a dud. This one for sure. This one, <laughs> this one I really think is going to happen because you've got so many teams high on the draft board who don't necessarily need yet more and more young guy or who have a, a mandate to win now. Um, and, 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 and that that movement may open up some things, too. So I just think we're going to see, you know, with so few teams having significant cap room, with a lot of teams trying to, to lower their payrolls, um, I just think it's going to be a very active offseason. Um, and then I'll put a pin in this one. Just a small pin. I'm not predicting this. I wonder if a year from now or two years from now, at the latest, we're talking about them breaking up the backcourt, the Cavs, um, for all the reasons we alluded to earlier. So, like, I'm not predicting it. I'm just saying I, I wonder how many times if they don't break through, if they can't find the right supporting cast, and especially under this, this newly more, even yet more constrictive CBA, I don't know if having two max guards is 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 the right. I, I just don't know if that's the right structure. And so I wonder if at some point in the in the, in the next couple of years, um, there's a pivot away from that. Uh, I would just say Mitchell's contract would would line up with what you're saying there. If people go look at his opt out, yeah, that that's the part of it that I think it's he can right. What he but says he wants to do. If you think he wants out, yeah. or if you've already decided yeah. or concluded that this isn't working, you're going to preempt that either by trading Garland or trading Mitchell. So, and and like I don't I don't know which of those is the one that sends more tremors down the spines of, of a Cavs fan at this point. But I I I just think that there might be a a, a lifespan to how um to to that pairing. And on this, just the new CBA um makes I. You might have a better read on this than me. It makes life harder, I think, for a team. I, we've hit on this a little bit, but I, it could make life harder for some of these teams to run out their rosters. Correct? I think that's kind of where it seems like we might be going. Some of the middle class stuff, when you start spending and have guys on max deals, it might just be harder to kind of round out the roster in a real way. Yeah, and I think that's by design. What the NBA really wants is um, to have as much of a... a, a, a not an even distribution. There's never an even distribution, but to have the top end talent as distributed as possible. So it's getting harder and harder to have a warrior style super team when they had, you know, four guys who are all all stars at the same time. Right. Um, even having three of those is going to be really difficult if they're on on full 30, 35 percent of the cap max salaries. Right. If, if one of your if one of your your all stars happens to still be on their rookie deal, it's a little bit different. But if they're all guys who are on their second or third contracts, the NBA wants to make it incredibly painful, both in luxury tax payments, repeater tax payments, and in now losing this exception, that exception, the ability to do the sign and trade, the ability to, to add anybody of substance at all. It's that's by design because they would rather have, you know, the, the talent more evenly distributed across the league. And we are, we have already seen from previous CBAs where it ended up this season. We saw them like the most compressed standings in modern history or history period, possibly, and a really weird playoffs because uh, this is what the NBA wants. And so, no, they're not going to be able to have Jared Allen, Evan Mobley, Donovan Mitchell, Darius Garland um, throughout whatever this, this era is. At some point, one of those guys is definitely going, and maybe more than one, because it's, it's going to be harder and harder to have more than two max players, um, and certainly any more than three. And I know Jared Allen's not on a max deal, um, but, uh, but he's on a very high deal. And so I, it will push teams more toward trying to say, well, if we do get our two stars, our two guys who are definitely worth the max, you know, the, the, the max, the super max, whatever it may be, um, can we get a bunch of guys in that middle range somewhere in, you know, five, six, 10, 12 million a year, 15 million, you know, more movable pieces so that if we hit a brick wall, it's easier to change out the parts around our two stars. Um, and also so that we're not bumping up against those you know, that so-called second apron where all of a sudden you're losing exceptions and all these other abilities to to add to your roster. So, yeah, it's a challenge like the, it's, you know, they're they're all threading needles from from now on. 
Howard back. Read him at GQ. Catch him on various Lockdown pods at the current moment. Howard, thank you so much for, for coming on Lockdown Calves. My pleasure, Chris. Thanks for having me.